This rapid review is going to focus on structural unemployment, one of the three types of unemployment we studied. But before we can really focus on structural unemployment, I want to talk about our classical model of the labor market, because the best way to grasp how structural unemployment works is really to contrast it with the classical model we studied earlier in the semester. So as a reminder, our classical model featured uh, supply and demand for labor. The supply here is denoted by L bar. There's a fixed number of people who want to work uh, and have a job. You might think that's kind of ridiculous. If the wage was really, really, really low, like say one penny, then maybe no one would want to work because that's really not getting paid very much. But whatever, we're going to simplify a bit and say there's a, there's a fixed supply of labor. And then there's demand for labor, which depends on the productivity, what the, fir what the workers can do for the firms. Um, and if the, they can add a lot of extra output, they would have a high marginal product of labor. They would do a lot for the firm, so the firm would like to hire a lot of people. If the marginal product is low, on the other hand, they wouldn't like to hire a lot of people. And that led us to this conclusion that the um, marginal product of labor here is basically the demand for labor. So we've labeled our supply and demand. And then the way the model works is you're familiar with supply and demand. There's some equilibrium where the two intersect. And that's where the wage balances the quantity supplied and quantity demanded to equal each other. And we get some overall real wage noted W over P. We also worked with this algebraically. Um, so over on the right, we have as, as a specific example, we have this Cobb-Douglas production function, K to the 1 half times L to the 1 half. We're told that L is 100 and K is 16. So L of being 100 is telling us that the supply of labor is 100. It's fixed at 100. So we could label that here on our diagram. This is 100 people who want to work. The demand for labor is going to be based on the marginal product of labor. And we know for the Cobb-Douglas, that's 1 minus alpha, alpha being the exponent on K. So 1 minus 1 half is 1 half uh, times Y over L. And Y here is k to the 1 half, so that's the square root of 16 is 4, times l to the 1 half, that's the square root of 100 is 10. So that's 40, so 1 half times 40 over l. So our MPL is 20 over l. And that's the equation we've graphed here as demand. 20 over l is hyperbolic. It looks like sort of like the curve we've drawn in for demand. Um, and now we'd like to actually solve for where supply equals demand. So that would be where we plug in the supply of 100, and then it cuts through the MPL at some point, and that gives us the real wage. So it'll be real wage equals 20 over L. We'll plug in the 100 here, and we get 20 over 100 is 1 fifth or 0.2. So the equilibrium real wage is 0.2. And the thing I want you to notice here is that there's 100 people who want to work. That's the quantity supplied. There's 100 people that the firms are hiring. So, the, so there's no unemployment whatsoever. So we'll notice there is no unemployment. And then obviously, for our models with structural unemployment, there will be some unemployment. So we want to think about, well, what is different? What will change in this model uh, that will introduce structural unemployment? And the answer is that there will be wage rigidity. The real wage won't be able to adjust to balance supply and demand. It will be fixed for some reason. And, it, and it, when, when we say it's fixed, we often talk about it being it's rigid. It can't adjust. It, it's not flexible. So one example of how this could, that could happen is that suppose a union negotiates a contract and the contract requires a real wage of 0.4 then that would make the wage stuck at 0.4. It can't adjust to balance supply and demand. And we'll see that the consequence is going to be unemployment. Specifically, it'll be structural unemployment. So to make it concrete, suppose our, from the previous slide, we had this equation, the real wage equals the marginal product of labor. And the marginal product of labor was 20 over L. And this was the, uh, the demand equation. So specifically, that's LD, the, the amount of labor demanded. If the real wage has to be 0.4 because of contracts, then we know 0.4 will equal 20 over LD. And we can solve for the amount of labor demanded. It is going to be 50. Well, that's not good because we know the supply was 100. 100 people wanted to work. And we've drawn that in here over on the right. The supply is drawn in at 100. The demand curve is drawn like before. It's 20 over L. But we know the real wage has to be 0.4. And we calculated that the quantity of labor demanded 
at that real wage is only 50 workers. So we have this gap between the 50 people that are hired and the 100 people who want to work. The 50 who are left over are all unemployed. So this, is, this represents graphically structural unemployment. So we can see how if for whatever reason the, the real wage can't adjust to balance supply and demand, there will be some amount of unemployment. There will be more people who want to work than jobs available for them to work in. Well, I mean, specifically, it'll only be if the, if the wage is stuck, you know, above the equilibrium point. Um, so the last thing we might want to think about is we know unions can cause wage rigidity. Are there any other factors that we might think of that would be contributing to wage rigidity? And I'm going to leave that as an exercise for you. There's two reasons we talked about in class that we'd expect wages to be rigid aside from unions. And you should look in your notes or, you know, test yourself or make new notes and make sure that you know these three factors. Thanks for watching.